Well, I've been uh, enjoying the wrestle as we dive into Revelation. Uh, as, a, as a heads up and as we dive in, you actually, if you use paper to get your sermon notes, you'll need two bits of paper today. And one bit, I encourage you to tuck away in your Bible. It is like the, well, it is the playbill of Revelation. I've taken that from Scott McKnight's book. And it just explains the, some of the different characters in Revelation and the parts they play. I really enjoyed going to see Hamilton, uh, the musical, in Melbourne uh, a couple of years ago. And when you go to it, you, you get a playbill and it explains all the different characters and who's playing what and what role they're playing. And in some way, it's, as we approach Revelation, it's helpful to have the playbill. Uh, and as we get ready to talk about Babylon, uh, it's also important just to remember the five principles we introduced last week when it gets in, as we look at Revelation, there are five things we said that's important to keep in mind. The first one is, uh, I, I think is true for all, all reading of the Bible. And I think this is a, one of the most helpful tools to work out whether or not your reading of the Bible is accurate. And that is this, that all helpful and true reading of the Bible produces the fruit of the Spirit in the people who are reading it. Like the, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, able to divide between joints and marrow, soul and spirit. And if your reading of the Bible is leading you to be fearful or leading you to act in ways that dismiss other people or dehumanise other people, it is almost guaranteed that you are misreading the Bible. That the, the, all healthy readings of the Bible lead you towards the fruit of the Spirit. That's the first principle we said last week. The second principle we said that revelation, the word revelation means unveiling and it reveals deep truth at many levels and if you are looking too simplistically at revelation, you'll miss the deep truth. It, it is very clear from the, the way revelation uses numbers to the way uh, it uses pictures and, and symbols that generally speaking, Revelation should be read symbolically and, uh, and, so, and we should seek to understand the deep truth behind those symbols rather than trying to read it literally. There are places in Revelation where it says this is what this means and we can uh, read those things literally where John is saying this is what these things mean but too much damage has been done by too many people trying to, to work out this is what this thing means and usually they've been, history has demonstrated that they've been wrong. <laughs> uh, so reading Revelation should be done symbolically. The third thing we said, uh, that to read Revelation just on, on face value without reference to the Old Testament means you miss much of what Revelation is about. Revelation is the book of the Bible that references the Old Testament most. And in fact, in, there are more allusions to the Old Testament in Revelation than in the rest of the New Testament combined. About half the verses uh, allude to things in the Old Testament. Over 200, I think it's 210 or something like that, verses refer to the Old Testament. And one of the challenges for us is we are not steeped in the Old Testament in the way that first century Jewish people were. And so there's so much we miss, particularly if we are seeing things as allusions to the 21st century rather than uh, the Old Testament. So we can misread Revelation if we don't read it in terms of the Old Testament. That's the third thing we said. Uh, the fourth thing we said is we were quite, last week we quoted Einstein. He said, look, your imagination can help you understand things that your intellect can't. That in order to read Revelation well, you actually need to apply the brain, your, that part of your brain that thinks in pictures and symbols, that part of your brain that is your imagination. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It means that big things... 
are best communicated symbolically and artistically and with imagination rather than A plus B equals C. Revelation is not an A plus B equals C book. It is a book that m needs to be read with your imagination engaged. We're going to look at that in just a minute as we look at Babylon and how we need to engage our imaginations to understand what Babylon is about. And the fourth thing that we need to understand as we look at Revelation is John had a very clear purpose in writing Revelation. His very clear purpose was to encourage the members of the seven churches in whom he was concerned that Babylon had had too much influence on those seven churches and that those seven churches had not had enough influence on Babylon. And that Revelation is written to help people be faithful disciples of Jesus in the world they find themselves in. Re Revelation is written to help you be a faithful disciple of Jesus. So as we dive in, this playbill, which is also you'll find, if you've got the online notes, you'll find this playbill in that, up the front of that as well, where we link all the different characters of Revelation. Um, and we're going to start the story today. At, we're going we're gonna to come back to John's specific words to the specific churches, but we're going to dive into the, 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 uh, the apocalyptic literature, which is, starts in chapter 4. So if you've, got, if you've got your Bibles, turn to chapter 4. And again, just as a, one of the things that comes through in the playbill is that one, you, we need to understand that Revelation is about a cosmic battle of powers. And there are two teams in Revelation. There is Team Lamb and there is Team Dragon. And we'll talk more about that as we undergo, as we, as we dive into Revelation. But uh, what we see being unveiled, and I, I, the more I dive into Revelation, the more I'm experiencing it as an unveiling, which is what the word literally means. I think Revelation's task is to unveil the world you find yourself in. That's, that's what the word of Revelation literally means, un unveiling. And so we dive in at chapter 4, uh, and the heading in my Bible is the throne in heaven. Before we read that, it's important to just put ourselves, imagine ourselves in the, the, the f place of these first century hearers of Revelation. And remember, part of the reason uh, it's important to engage your imagination and how it's worked is most people in the first three century, first 300 years that Revelation was available, actually first 500 years that Revelation was available, most people engaged with it by hearing it, not reading it. It was performed almost as a play. And uh, the first thing that they heard was about this throne room, which we need to understand in their context. You see, they were well aware of throne rooms. They were under the most uh, oppressive and successful political regime in human history. Rome oppressed and suppressed nations right across the known world at the time and did, did so for centuries. And the centre of that power was the, the throne of Caesar and the throne room was the, the place in which all the decisions were made. When Caesar was seated and made pronouncements, everybody had to do what he was told, what they were told. And everybody, we see the Apostle Paul appealing to his Roman citizenship, everybody understood that being a citizen of Rome meant something. And they talk about the Pax Romana, the peace that comes through Rome, the peace that comes through power. That the, the, they were living in a world that was dominated by a power. Now, with that in mind, imagine how they hear this. In verse 2 of chapter 4, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven, with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. You see, this is 
picturesque language. We're meant to not just try and analyse, okay, what does that word mean, but to actually let us just treat this book as though you're a 10-year-old reading the Narnia Chronicles and trying to imagine what this would look like. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were the 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And then I'll skip down to where uh, all these four beasts that uh, represent all of creation sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. I don't, can you see, if you're a first century Christian and you hear about the God who is on the throne, you, what you're also hearing is that God is the authority and that other throne in Rome is not. You are hearing a counterclaim about how authority actually works. And so it, it is, the very first few verses of Revelation set up a revolution and set up the, the dichotomy, the battle between the powers. Now, we're going to dive then, encourage you to keep your imaginations active because what we see, as, in order to understand the context where we, and, and the, the, the context that John is writing into, we need to understand what he meant by Babylon. And in order to do that, we need to move over to chapter 17 of Revelation. So the, we've got this picture of God on the throne and the throne room. We're going to come back to that. Uh, there's a few things we're going to come back to. Now let's in, keep that imagination going, this incredible majestic scene of God's throne room. Now brace yourself, this is going to be a bit of a confronting scene. But again, you want to engage your imagination and see if you can hear the implications. This is uh, John talking about Babylon, verse 3 of chapter 17. And again, engage your imagination. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. Uh, and again, one of the challenges even for us engaging our imagination that the, uh, the writers or, or the, the translators have, have, have sort of toned it down a bit. Like the abominable things as uh, a word that can mean feces. Like it, 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 it can, it's, imagine when, it, when the word abominable, think of the worst things you could possibly have in a cup, that's what she's got in a cup. Uh, and the filth of her adulteries, the name written on her forehead was a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Now, what's John doing here? We've got two pictures. We've got this picture of the throne room of God. Now, we've got this picture of this woman on this beast. What, what is this beast? A lot of people have tried to wrestle with that and... and Remember, one of the things we said last week was one of the, the damaging ways people have approached a revelation is by speculation, where they've tried to work out, okay, the Antichrist is this and Babylon is that. A lot of people had different theories about Babylon. People have thought it was Rome. Other people have thought it was Russia. Uh, some people have thought it's the United States. Uh, people have had different theories about you know, in, in our time, what is Babylon? Expecting Babylon to be something that comes in and, and looking for some kind of woman to be on some kind of beast. That's why we've got to understand, okay, no, we, we need to understand both what John is meaning by Babylon and then what does that mean for us? Because I, I think the speculative approach to Revelation, where you try and work out in your newspaper what's happening in Revelation, actually makes... Revelation a bit scarier in some ways but a lot safer in others because it means it's something that's going to happen outside you 
and doesn't affect you. It's something that's going to happen to you and you're worrying about political powers that are going to, they're going to happen. Well, I, I actually think uh, Revelation and, uh, and particularly Babylon are things we need to, that are describing our lived reality now. So why do I think that? Well, let's talk about uh, what John means by Babylon. He, he's actually fairly clear but again, because we read in first, we're reading first century uh, writing in the 21st century, there are things we miss. Uh, the f- first thing he, he says about what he means by Babylon is that in verse 9, the seven heads are seven hills on which the woman Babylon sits. Now, all of us, we go, oh, so. Every first century person knew what that meant because they all had coins. And I'll show you a, a coin uh, because they all knew something. This is the, the goddess Roma on the back of the Sesterius coin, which is a quarter of a denarius. And you'll notice Roma here is actually sitting on seven hills because Rome, the city, sat on seven hills. Everybody knew about the seven hills of Rome. So when they read this woman sitting on seven hills, they understood that uh, John is using uh, coded language, but more than coded language, insulting language about Rome. And in case we're not, we're not absolutely sure, he actually lands it in verse 18 where he says, the woman you saw is the great city, which in the first century was the language to describe Rome. Uh, We also know the New Testament writers thought of uh, Rome as Babylon and used that code and insult for uh, Rome. Peter, 1 Peter 5, 3, she who is in Babylon and talking there about the church in Rome, chosen together with you, sends her greetings, and so does my son Mark. So we can take that off now, Paul, thanks. But you'll find we've got pictures of those coins in the notes, if you're interested. So so John is using the language of Babylon to describe Rome. Why does he do that? Well, there is a a sense in which uh, going around saying, you know, this current power that is all powerful uh, is actually no power at all was a health hazard and so uh, there is a, a code in it but it wasn't too it was pretty straightforward to read through that code what they're also saying do you remember in the old testament what babylon was what did babylon represent in the old testament it was the power that came and finally sacked judah and took them into exile. Nebuchadnezzar, remember the book of Daniel, and, and what is clear is uh, Babylon was the world power for a time, but it was actually a short time. Uh, the Medes and the Persians came over and, and took over from Babylon, and so in, in calling Rome Babylon, Babylon, what John is saying is you powerful city who think you're so powerful your days are numbered we've seen people like you before it's using an insult of a a fallen now defeated enemy and putting that on Rome it is a it is a claim about revolution it's also something that was common in Jewish literature at the time it was a common Jewish insult for Rome we won't get into it but uh, if you're interested, and there, you'll find these in the, the book, there are uh, notes from the Sibylline oracles, which were written around the same time as Revelation, uh, Jewish people talking about Rome as Babylon, and also from a book called For Ezra, a Jewish apocalyptic book that also calls Rome Babylon, very clearly. And so, What we can understand is that John is using the language of Babylon to describe Rome, but one of the other things in God's providence, by not just saying Rome is this, he's also 
pointing at all the things that Rome represents. And they are the same things that have been present through history whenever there are dominant powers. And it is uh, a fellow by the, by the name William Stringfellow says, the moral pretenses of imperial Rome, the millennial claims of Nazism, the arrogance of Marxist dogma, the anxious insistence that America be number one among the nations are all versions of Babylon. Whenever a nation or power sets itself up as the power, that is what uh, John is trying to unveil because there are dark forces setting themselves up in, in any situation when somebody sets themselves up as the power apart from God. Howard Brooks and Gwyther say Babylon exists wherever socio-political power comes together or coalesces in an entity that stands against the worship of God alone. One of the things we need to learn to do is to spot Babylon. Just as John was worried about Babylon getting into the church and the church not getting into Babylon, I reckon if he was writing to us, he would be saying similar things. I'm worried that you guys are so affected by Babylon that you're ineffective in your witness to the world. Another way the, the New Testament talks about Babylon is it actually uses the language of the world. 1 John, the, in my view, people have discussions about this, but in, the person that, in my view that wrote 1 John is also the person that wrote Revelation, is also the person that wrote is the disciple John. Um, he says this, Don't love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. What John was trying to help people understand was this world is not amoral. There are forces that are setting themselves up to get you to align with powers other than the powers of Jesus. They want to set an agenda for you. And it is very easy to find yourself wrapped up in the agenda of the world. Jesus warns us, he says, the world is not amoral. Satan, he says in the book of John 14, 30, is the prince of this world. And so when we see Babylon as some future political power coming, then it's a bit kind of safe. We, don't have, we just have to watch and keep an eye on our newspapers and we don't have to worry too much about what it, how it affects us. But I think what John is trying to do is to unveil the truth of the New Testament teaching that the world is a system controlled by forces of evil that want to set you on a course other than that that God has for you. So I think we need to learn to spot Babylon. We need to learn to spot Babylon and where it's trying to set the agenda. Uh, I, Scott McKnight very helpfully has from on the basis of, Bab of uh, the book of Revelation, has identified seven characteristics of Babylon to watch out for. Seven characteristics of Babylon to watch out for. The first characteristic is Babylon is an anti-God system. It is a, a system of power that says this is what you need to be in order to be okay. It gives you messages about what an okay self is and you will never satisfy those messages. You'll never get to a point where Babylon says, there, you've done it, you're right. Because Babylon will always be telling you, no, you've got to get this thing and do that thing and fit into this box. 
Babylon is the anti-God system that Satan is the prince of and the, the designer of. And one of the, the constant messages of the Bible to the church is, watch out. If you, ta- if you are not seeing the anti-God messages that are trying to get you to worship other things than Yahweh, then you are going to end up shaped by Babylon. So the, the first characteristic of Babylon is that Babylon is an anti-God system. The second characteristic of Babylon we see in uh, Revelation 17, 4, the woman is dressed in purple and scarlet and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls, and she's got this golden cup. It's opulent. The world will never have enough. That the, the, those who we aspire to, the, 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 the rich and the famous, will never get to a point where they have enough. It is opulent and Babylon disdains ordinariness. Babylon disdains the, the ordinariness of life. That somehow you've got, to, you've got to have the best car, the best house, the, the biggest bank account, the most beautiful partner, the most beautiful kids. And that's what Babylon's message for you is. You need to live in opulent luxury. And, and that's exactly the opposite message that the, the writers of the New Testament want us to hear. Jesus says directly, you can serve God or you can serve money. You cannot serve both. Timothy, Paul's letter to Timothy, he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. The love of money becomes a trap. He says, you brought, you brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. So, the first sign that uh, Babylon is active is that you are getting messages that say this is what you need to be in order to be okay and, those, and that, that thing will not be God. It'll be other forces and other things you need to measure up to. The second thing is Babylon will be telling you, you need more. You need opulence. You need luxury. You need everything laid on. You need gold, silver and precious stones you need the best cars, you need... Babylon is opulent, ridiculous, and it doesn't value the ordinariness of life, which is actually where real life is found. Real life is found not in, the, in your bank account or your house. It's found in the day-to-day relationships. It's found in the moments, not in the stuff. The third thing is... Babylon is murderous. Any person who attempts to go counter to the Babylonian way, to the world's way, will ultimately be in Babylon's sights. Babylon, the world, actively works to silence those who speak a different truth, who live a different truth. Now, we see this very practically and sadly happening in the persecuted church around the world. We see those forces terrified of what the church might bring because every time... (laughs) The church is allowed to bubble up. Power gets defeated. People, totalitarianism gets defeated. Totalitarian power doesn't like the Christian church. At the same time, we've got to watch other forces. It may not be so overt. They may not be pulling out a gun or a knife, but maybe just be wanting to silence an alternate way of seeing things, to de-platform, to cancel. Forces that will want to take the voice away of people that are speaking truth to power. So Babylon actively seeks to silence 
those who speak God's truth. That's one of the things to look out for from Babylon. That's the third thing. The fourth thing is that Babylon is concerned with image rather than substance. That how you're looking on your Facebook feed is more important than how you're actually doing. Babylon is about image rather than substance. Rome as a nation was meticulously cared for. There were all these statues and signs everywhere. It was incredible. People would go in, and it's interesting, Revelation 17, 8 says, people were astonished when they see the, the beast in action. It was in something where it's jaw-dropping. And again, it's not a, a valuing of the, the, the messiness and the smallness of ordinary life. It's about image. And there'll be this sense in which you've got to project an image other than the truth. Jesus says the truth will set you free. Babylon says you've got to look different than you actually are. Babylon gets you to live in a phony kind of way focused on image and, you, and, uh, and presenting an image where your goal is to get people to think you're wonderful based on externals and, and based on a phony way of life. The fourth, the fifth characteristic of Babylon is that it seeks to conquer through power. It seeks to impose its will on other people through power. It's interesting that the, the Caesar was chosen, chose the, 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 lang, the name Caesar rather than emperor because Caesar is, was a military title about military conquest. And uh, it is true that uh, Babylon sees its, its, its way of fixing the world's problems and aligning it to its will through coercive power. It's a, it's a dominating force. It's militaristic. Millions and millions of people died for the Pax Romana. <laughs> The Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, was a furphy. It was an oppressive force that enforced its will on other people. And when you encounter people trying to enforce their will on you, then what you can see is Babylon in action. You've got to watch the temptation to try and enforce our will on other people because sometimes the church can end up and has ended up as agents of Babylon and finally secondly that no, second last not finally uh, Babylon is focused on economic exploitation do you know in uh, the uh, we've got these one of the incredible things about Pompeii, because it was frozen in time because of the volcano. So we got all these things that tell us about what life was like in the first century. And there's these mosaics on the floor in Pompeii that say, uh, hello, prophet, and prophet is happiness. That there is this sense in which Babylon is about economic exploitation. How can I sell you things so I get rich and you get less. And, and uh, one of the sad things, both about the, the military conquest of Rome uh, and, and also the economic exploitation, is that some of the products that got sold were people. Babylon wants to make money. Babylon wants... It's... it's uh, core good is money and power. That's how it measures whether things are going well. So economic exploitation is part of Babylon. We see that in the book of Revelation. And we see how the, the kings of the earth are focused on how they get rich because of Babylon. And finally, uh, Babylon is arrogant. Babylon is arrogant. The world is arrogant. It thinks its way is the only way. 
we see uh, the prostitute saying, I sit enthroned as a queen. I'm not a widow. I'll never mourn. She's boasting. She thinks she's got all the answers. And even in the fact that John is calling her Babylon, he's saying, you don't know how weak and pitiful you actually are. But every power that rises itself up believes their way is the only way. Every major political power in the history of humanity has believed their way is the only way. There's a fundamental arrogance. And we've got to watch because we're part of the Western world, which has been the major political power of our day. And there, there can be this fundamental arrogance that where we don't understand the level at which we are infected by Babylon. And so we have to face the fact that sometimes, as missionaries have even gone in overseas, they've not only have they brought Jesus with them, they've also brought Coca-Cola. Where we have brought our way of life, thinking that our way of life was Jesus' way of life. And what John is trying to unveil here, that there are forces in our way of life that are anti-Christ. See, we can get comfortable with the world. I, I love, even as, as John is writing all this out, and you see this happen the right the way through Revelation, because my guess is people are hearing this and they're going, oh. But in the middle of it all, John says this, these forces of Babylon, these forces of the beasts and the dragon that we're going to talk about next week, they're going to wage war against the Lamb in, in verse 14. But the Lamb's going to triumph over them because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and with Him will be His called, chosen and faithful followers. In the midst of talking about ba Babylon, it's like John says, just relax. I know this, is, this sounds bad, but the victory is won. You don't have to get stressed. It's going to be okay, but I want you to see how serious Babylon actually is. And I think he'd be wanting to say to us, I want you to see the level at which Babylon has shaped the way you live, think and act. I think what John very helpfully does for us in the book of Revelation is unveils a lot of the truth that the rest of the New Testament is trying to communicate but we can kind of think, oh, that's, that's nice. That's safe. By describing Babylon, describing the world as a prostitute, drunk on the filth, we should feel revolted at the ways of the world. And I think we should start to understand more what Paul wrote when he said, don't conform to the pattern of this world. For Paul, this was serious. He's saying, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. For the Apostle Paul, he knew that there were these forces that wanted to get you to focus on anything other than God, that the world is not amoral. And I, I don't know how to say this, I, I, I just, I, the more I read Revelation, the more I hang around the New Testament, the more I open myself to, to God, the more I realise the level at which I personally get shaped by the world, how our assumptions of life are shaped by the world and how we can kind of go, oh, that's okay. We give ourselves a pass. Through revelation, John is wanting to confront us and say, don't give yourself a pass. The life that Babylon promises, that the world promises, is not life at all. All the things it tells you you need in order to enjoy your life ultimately amount to nothing without Jesus. Paul writes, don't deceive yourselves in Corinthians. If you, any of you think you're wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools. 
so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it's written, he catches the wise in its craftiness. One of the dangers for us is we can think we've got to win in the world, in the world's game, playing the world's game. And Paul's saying, watch out, if you think you're really smart, if you, if, if you think the world should be looking at you and going, yeah, you've really got it together, well, that's dangerous territory. I find it interesting that as Jesus was coming towards the cross and the last things he was praying for his followers, he was praying about this stuff. He says, I've revealed you, this is John 17, 6, I've revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. That Jesus sees his followers of people who have been called out of Babylon, out of the world. And in fact, he goes on in verse 14 and says, I've given them your word. And the world's hated them. The ba Babylon's hated them. For they are not of the world anymore than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. You see, Jesus isn't wanting to zap us away from the world, to save us from the world. He's wanting us to be in the world, but not of the world. To be salt and light. To be his agents of new creation. And one of the, the challenges for us is the exact same challenge that faced the seven churches of Revelation. That Babylon can be getting too much into the church and shaping the church and the church isn't getting enough into Babylon and being the salt and light that reveals the truth and life that only comes through Jesus. I think we need to hear the voice from heaven that we see in Revelation chapter 18, which doesn't make a lot of sense. If you think this is all about the future, then these words will not make a lot of sense to you. But can you hear, this is a voice of heaven speaking directly to the seven churches and I think speaking directly to us. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. Don't let Babylon set your agenda. Babylon's days are numbered. The world's messages, the world's uh, agenda for you is not going to lead to life. This battle is won by the one who says he is the way, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. What's exciting is that you are not here to take up space. You exist in the middle of a cosmic battle a battle that too often we are blind to, a battle fought in the midst of Babylon that Jesus isn't praying that the Father will take you away from, but that he is praying that its agenda won't be your agenda. He's praying that you will be an agent of a different kingdom, that you will be a dissident, a rebel, an ambassador for a kingdom in waiting a kingdom where life is actually to be found. As we start to glimpse Revelation, I think Revelation helps us glimpse the world in which we're living. The world that is trying to set an agenda for us to keep us safe and out of trouble, to keep, us, to keep our eyes off Jesus and on ourselves. But we are being called to be citizens of a different kingdom. Let's pray.
Jesus, thank you for your servant, John, and the way through him you are able to unveil the reality we live in. Forgive us for the fact that too many of us get comfortable in Babylon. We get comfortable with Babylon's agenda and we end up letting Babylon shape us rather than your kingdom and your heart. Jesus, can you help us keep our eyes on you? Thank you for the, just the reminder in the midst of all of that, that the victory's won, the battle's done. But we've got to make sure we come out of her, come out of Babylon and don't let Babylon set our agenda for us. We need your help. Forgive us for all the times we take our eyes off you and put it on the stuff that Babylon has for us. Help us, Jesus. Keep our eyes firm, fixed, firmly fixed on you and open to all you have for us. We ask this in your name. Amen.